everyone. I'm really happy to announce today's speaker, Dr. Hélène Collineau. Hélène is a medical doctor and a PhD in social epi from the University in Toulouse, Paul Sabatier. Hélène is currently also a research associate at Imperial College in London. And um, Elan's focus is on causal mediation analysis to study the effects of sex and gender on health outcomes. So we're looking very much forward to today's talk, capturing gender and epidemiology from concepts to methodological strategies. Thank you, Mesha. <laughs> Um, so I'm truly honored to be here today and to meet you. And I would like to thank you, Masha and the bank uh, to, for inviting me. Uh, so yes, I'm currently a research associate uh, in, at Imperial College London, but I did my PhD in Toulouse in the equity team, which is a team uh, working on social epidemiology. And the presentation I'm going to give today is based on this PhD work. Uh, which are focused on translating concepts into methodological strategy. So before I begin, I'd like to offer a few, few clarification about my approach to causal inference methods, uh, because often when I'm speaking to an audience of researchers and notions that I've worked on gender using causal inference methods on mediation analysis, it's usually the later parts that piques interest. <laughs> And especially when I specify that I use contrafactual reasoning and G methods for estimation. But I want to clarify my position uh, in this field because first I'm not a statistician. And then my interest in this metho method isn't particularly technical. Um, in my view, using a J computation method doesn't necessarily result in better research on some exploratory studies based solely on attenuation analysis, for example, can sometimes be more informative and insightful. So for me, the key interest of, uh, in these approaches lies earlier in the process, before the estimation, uh, at the stage where we need to specify our hypothesis and determine how we'll go about estimating a, parameters, a parameter to answer our research question. And um, again, this is not about debat debating the purity of a DAG, uh, the separation criteria on how certain we can be that what represented on the DAG is truly accu accurate, but more about thinking more clearly about our assumption, um, making them transparent and open to discussion. And also clearly specify the effect we want to uh, estimate to build to build informed model and qualitatively assess possible bias. So it was just a little preamble to explain what I won't be delving into uh, the technical aspect of mediation analysis or J computation today, but uh, more into gender concept and operationalization. That is um, some ways we can go from concepts to uh, from concepts on research questions to quantitative analysis. So the starting point of my work uh, was the concept of allostatic load. Um, it's a measure commonly used in social epidemiology to explore the long-term physiolo physiological wear and tear caused by, by the intense and repeated activation of, of stress response mechanisms. Um, it allows us to make a mechanistic link between social determinants and health. And it's a composite measure based on uh, derived from several values uh, of biomarkers representing the different physiological systems involved. And in uh, methods frequently used to combine these biomarkers values into a single score is to count the numbers of biomarkers uh, considered at risk for each individual. So this approach requires defining a threshold for each biomarker uh, above which the value is deemed at risk. And is, uh, in the literature, uh, these thresholds are uh, often defined separately for each sex category. So why um, using sex-specific scores? Uh, the justification sometimes only applied is that, is that this approach accounts for sex differences 
attributed to sexual dimorphism. But I began to question this rationale, thinking, aren't we basing this on an unfounded and likely false hypothesis? Actually, this assumption, or rather as assertion, that observed biological differences are necessarily and entirely linked to sexual dimorphism reflects a common but flawed association between sorry, between sex uh, being, being bi biological factors being equated with sex and sociological factors being equated with gender. For example, variables like occupation, domestic workload are considered gender related. And while things like hemoglobin levels, renal function, height, um, lean mass are seen as sex related variables. Yet, social and biological phenomena are far from being so compartmentalized. First, our biology influences our interaction with the world, but equally, our social experience shapes our biology. And in social ep epidemiology, we use the concept, the concept of embodiment to describe all, all aspects of our lives, our behaviors, our physical, social, stress-related exposures, and so on, become embodied um, and shape our body and our physiology, our bi biology, and our health. So given that the gender system results in categorized men and categorized women li living on average different lives, because individuals ban based on their sex assigned at birth do not on average encounter the same um, the same physical, social, economic, cultural, emotional exposures, and so on over their lifetime, they experience different stressors, adopt different behaviors. Consequently, categorized men and women will on average not produce the same adaptive response leading to bi different biological outcomes. So it seems quite logical to conclude that the biological differences observed on average between categorized men and women cannot be automatically attributed to sexual dimorphism. Rather, they may be rooted at least in part in social gender mechanisms. That is, in the differentiated distribution of social determinants between sex categories due to the gender system. So in the end, I could have relied on this reasoning, which I believe is simply common sense, uh, to address this question. However, I spent four years of my PhD providing quantitative evidence uh, that this hypothesis is indeed unjustified and more broadly to challenge the way we think about and operationalize this question in epidemiology. So since gender is a, con a complex concept and can refer to multiple phenomena, I think it may be helpful to start by clarify why um, I mean by the term here. So first, gender can refer to gender identity, um, which is a personal experience and can be defined as how an individual positions or experiences themselves on the spectrum from femininity to masculinity or outside that spectrum. This identity is influenced by the gender system in which the individual lives, as well as, the, as other social, structural, and individual factor, factors like the ability or possibility of self-determination and self-assertion. And it doesn't necessarily reflect how the individual acts, behaves, and how their environment interacts with them. Um, actually, when I talk about gender, for, for example, I study the impact on gender in biology and health. Uh, this is often, uh, often this first dimension that comes into mind, but it is not what I concretely study uh, in my work, so I won't go further um, about this specific aspect. Uh, gender can also refer to what I've defined as gender personality, which isn't an official term, but uh, it's something I've distinguished from the others because it seems to be what scores developed in psychology, such as the BEM sex world inventory or the conformity to masculine norms uh, um, inventory, are trying to capture. 
I personally find this course problematic because they're based on stereotypes like associating competition with masculinity and collaboration with femininity and pre presented as innate or early determined. And they also don't take it into account context like generation, age, uh, class, race, etc. So I think they can lead to the essentialization of a certain form of femininity or masculinity as a type of psyche or personality uh, conceptualized as natural and typological, typologically stable across population. And this is not a, a perspective I adhere to. So that's why I distinguish this from the concept of gender performance, uh, which now relates to how an individual's observable social characteristics and behaviors on how their environment in a broad sense interacts with them uh, at a given time, of this align with the stereotypes or norms of the sex categories uh, they belong to. So here, gender is more conceptualized as a normative phenomenon, socially constructed, and whose values may vary from a population to another. And finally, we arrive at more structural or systemic definitions of genders, uh, of gender as system, a system of categorization, meaning the process by which social characteristics and behaviors are differently distributed according to the sex category assigned at birth. So here, gender is the system that produces the gender role, roles. So, and we can uh, also add another level, approaching definition used in sociology, where gender defines now the process that polarize and hierarchize this humanity in human and human characteristics into two unequal categories, masculine or feminine. So in other words, uh, it's a binary and hierarchical categorization system that includes the power relation between the, these two categories. So to explain how biological differences between men and women are constructed, it seems to me that the gender I'm trying to capture is the differential social construction. So it corresponds either to uh, the fact that that or the process by which uh, norms and characteristics of different kinds, identity, experiences, behaviors, roles, relationships, power, etc. are differently prescribed to and performed by individuals based on their uh, by on the binary sex category assigned at birth or uh, to how um, these norms manifest in individuals, meaning the extent to which a given individuals, a given individual social characteristics and behaviors are align with the norms of masculinity or femininity in their population. So either the process or the outcome in individuals. So now, how can we operationalize this, then, these concepts to meet our, ob our objectives? So go to uh, quantitative analysis. So it seems that the first is the instinct of any epidemiologist is to construct a variable, so uh, to study a phenomenon. So here the AID, would be to define a gender variable, measured for each individual, and then estimate the, the portion of biological differences, um, that is the total effect of the sex category that pass through this variable using a mediation analysis. So we already see here with the help of this conceptual graph that there is a clear limitation to this strategy and more broadly to any attempt to absolutely distinguish biological mechanism from social mechanism in sex differences. Indeed, we can never fully capture all aspects of social life that contribute to making gender in individuals at every level on every moment. So we can never definitely say that the direct effect of sex category purely correspond to sexual dimorphism because we can never completely exclude that there are still social gender mechanisms remaining within that effect. 
So then, uh, how do we measure this gender, this individual gender? What we are trying to capture here uh, is gender as a role of our performance. So self-declared identity or gender score, like the BEM score, wouldn't align with this definition. But there is a third approach in the literature for constructing a gender variable uh, referred to as gender diagnostic. So these composite variables are, are, are built from the presence or absence of various gendered individual characteristics defined as such based on how these characteristics are distributed uh, by sex category in the population. So for example, if having a manual job is very common among those categorized as male and rare among those categorized as female, this variable would be considered gendered and its presence in a given individual would, would increase their masculinity score. So in other words, this approach involves considering an individual are more or less masculine or feminine based on how many, how many variable, how many masculine or feminine characteristics they have, with these characteristics being considered masculine or feminine because they are more frequent or have higher values among men or women in the studied population. So the theoretically, these indicators measure the level to which an individual conforms to a set of elements that, that constitute femininity or masculinity in a specific population, place, and time. And statistically, it's like a probability of being predicted um, as male based on characteristic associated with masculinity or predict as female uh, based on characteristics associated with femininity. And this gender uh, diagnostic measures um, are consistent with how gender can be conceptualized um, at the individual level in epidemiology as the result of a normative and systemic pressure that leads to a differential probability of having certain characteristics depending on sex category. And it is also a pragmatic tool that can be used in secondary data analysis based on available social variables. And it accounts for context as a score is defined for a given population based on the specific norms of that population derived from the distribution. And it's theoretically not directly transferable to other population. So in practice, uh, we can start with a set of, of social behavioral characteristics. Uh, for example, this is those I chose in a cohort of British people born in 1958. And since uh, the gender system can potentially impact all aspects of social life and individual behaviors, I, I thought it would be interested to try to broadly characterize, characterize the social, social life while remaining aware that it's impossible to capture it exhaustively. So uh, for example, here I use a set of variables related to uh, cultural, social, and economic capital, capitals as defined by Bourdieu, such as educational level, social class, and marital status, but also health-related behaviors like smoking and so on. And then by running a logistic regression model with sex category as the outcome, the value predicted by the model based on individual characteristics represent the gender score. So this score corresponds to the probability to belonging to the male sex category according to this model. It runs from zero meaning predicting female based on social behavioral characteristics, a proxy for very, very feminine gender, to one meaning predicting male based on social behavioral characteristics, a proxy for very masculinely gendered. So this approach has significant limitation and therefore requires caution. First, as I said earlier, it's clear that a diffuse and complex phenomenon like gender can never be fully captured by one variable. And the choice of variables to include 
and their respective weights in calculating the score is difficult to justify and can significantly impact the results. For example, here we saw that the distribution of a score varied significantly depending on the variables included in the models. And secondly, uh, since the gender process is not necessarily consistent at the individual level, uh, for example, a person might have a job considered uh, feminine but display domestic traits considered masculine, so reducing this diversity to a single variable inevitably leads to a loss of information. Thirdly, the presence of one or more gender dimension in an individual is not necessarily due solely to gender pressure, but also to other factors like social class, age, generation, etc. Uh, for instance, smoking can be, can be more common among, uh, among men in a population and thus considered a masculine uh, attribute, but these behaviors may also depend on age or social class. So the effect of such a variable is therefore difficult to interpret as a strict gender effect. Uh, and it also include a part uh, elements of cl class, age, culture, etc. So I, I would find hard to interpret concretely the meaning of the total effect of uh, this type of variable, um, even as a mediator, depending on the main exposure on the adjustment set, it might make sense. But for example, can we really interpret a statistical association between mortality and the gender score based on professional characteristics as a gender effect and rather than simply as an effect of those cate professional category characteristics. So more generally, the interpretation must be made with caution and depends heavily on how the analysis are constructed. So it seems necessary to go beyond just defining a variable and to consider the overall strategy anal uh, analysis strategy. So what alternative strategy can we adopt? <clears throat> so ultimately, if we move away from the specific question of biomarkers, a commonly used strategy to describe gender mechanisms is simply to comparing a social characteristics between sex category, categories. For example, in the British court, um, we observe that there are differences in economic capital at age 23, depending on sex category. And we can label this as a gender inequality or at least disparities produced by the gender system. So in this case, we are what we are looking at are the total effect of sex category on these social characteristics. And actually, it's common here to use the term gender instead of sex category, as this variable is often considered as a proxy for gender. From my perspe perspective, it's more accurate to stick with the, the term sex category because that was we really measures. And the term gender here could be misunderstood as referring to gender identity or performance, uh, which sex category doesn't measure at all. However, it's important to be much transparent about the mechanistic assumptions, particularly the idea that gender exists in the effect of sex category variable on and through social phenomena and not in the variable itself. Because here, if we consider the strategy used more broadly, sex category is just sex category and not a proxy, and gender is actually in what it produces, differences in economic capital through various mechanisms um, we can, that we can presume. So when we study the causal effect of a sex category variable, we are already dealing with two types of effects. The biological phenomena that this categorization aims to label, label and the effects of this categorization itself, meaning everything it conditions for the individual for, from the moment it is applied to them due to the gender system. So in terms of operationalization, 
Here, gender isn't in an individual defined sex variable, but rather in the effects of sex category on social behavioral characteristics. So here we are closer to the concept of gender as a system. And what's the difference when we are not looking at a social characteristic, but at a biomarkers like blood pressure and chol or cholesterol levels? Here, in the effect of sex category, unlike with economic capital, we can hypothesis that the two types of mechanisms are at play. One linked to biological and physiological mechanism, which might call sexual dimorphism, and another linked to the categorization itself, meaning everything uh, it conditions for the individual due to the gender system. So the strategy here would be to identify the portion of biological differences or total effects of sex category that, that passes through the effect uh, on the distribution of social behavioral characteristics, uh, that is the gender as an effect. So this time, we don't need to create an individually defined gender variable, variable so this allows us to avoid some of the limitation of the previous strategy. But we still face, we still face the main limitation, which is that we cannot include in our analysis all the social behavioral characteristics that might be impacted by the gender system. So once again, we won't be able to interpret the direct effect of sex category um, the one that don't pass through these characteristics as the total effect of, se of sexual dimorphism because we, because we can never fully extract all the potential social gender mechanism. The third strategy is more complex. Um, this third way of thinking about gender refers to genders as a system of categorization as is in the previous strategy, um, but also takes into account the fact that the systemic gender process varies in form and, or intensity depending on social group. It is even based on the idea that the differences between, when differences between sex categories are not stable, but vary across social groups, we can explain this difference, at least in part, by gender mechanisms. For example, if aggressivity is more often associated with women in population A, but more often with men in population B, we could conclude that the association of aggressivity with a specific sex is not natural, but related to systemic gender mechanism. So this conceptualization implied implies understanding gender this time not as a variable nor an effect, but as a different difference in effects. That is, the sex category doesn't have the same effect depending on the se a social environment. And the social environment does not have the same effects depending on the sex category. So it, in other words, it's an interaction. So according to this strategy, there is also no gender variable defined for a given individual. Instead, the hypothesis is that the effect of sex category on the value of biomarkers changes depending on the social environment. And again, this is where gender is located in the variability of the effect of sex. That is in the variability of observed biological differences between men and women across social groups. So the biological differences between sex category uh, still correspond to the passes, uh, path that start from the sex category and leads to the biomarker value. Um, but this time there are several direct paths, one for each group defined by the social environment, and it is the difference between these several paths that we seek to identify. So the variation um, in the gender process is actually an integral part uh, of the, is, its definition. Indeed, at uh, first glance, we might say that the phenomenon is gender when it depends 
on both sex category and social environment. For example, if the likelihood of obtaining leadership position, uh, so a social phenomenon dependent of many social determinants varies by sex category, we would say that this phenomenon, phenomenon is gendered. So in other words, the structural gender system distributes access to leadership position differently based on the sex category assigned at birth through various mechanisms. So this is represented in the second strategy. But it is possible for, for a phenomenon to depend on both sex and social environment without being gendered. For example, let's, let's imagine that uh, the head circumference of newborns differs on average uh, by sex category due to physical reasons of sexual dimorphism. On a, in a given society, pregnant individuals from a specific social group eat differently from others, and this diet affects the head circumference of newborns. But in this fictive society, the sex of the newborn, the unborn child, is not known. So in this case, sex and social environment through the diet of the pregnant person are causes of newborn head circumference. But this phenomenon is not gendered. It does not depend on gender process. It would only be gendered if the sex of the unborn child were known and if pregnant individuals also ate differently based on that information. So a phenomenon is gendered not only when it differed according to sex category and social environment, but also when the effect of our environment varies by sex category or when the effect of sex category varies by environment. Uh, and by the way, intuitively, we might hypothesize that the sex difference that exists invariably across all population is likely explained to a large extent by bi biological mechanisms. But uh, if its effects vary significantly across social classes or cultures, we would more logically hypothesize that gender mechanisms are predominant. So this, this approach uh, may be the more consistent with the concept of gender. However, interaction analysis is very difficult to perform and to interpret. Um, and again, we can't estimate here the pure effect of sexual dimorphism because, because we don't have any population of reference um, where there would be no gender mechanisms. So now how do we... Uh, translate these strategies to, into estimates, that is into values of interest to estimate in order to answer our research question. Sorry. So first, uh, what biological sex differences or total effect of sex category correspond to? Um, we can define it as the difference, for example, uh, between the average blood pressure if the whole population had been categorized as men, as male at as birth, versus if the whole population had been categorized as female. Using this marginal value for the whole population uh, is a way to, um, of comparing two identical positions. Uh, similar to the standard of uh, randomized control trial, trials, even, even though we are working here on, with observational data, so we recreate this comparability uh, through a kind of simulation. So in counterfactual notation, it is the difference between the potential outcome if we counterfactually intervene so that everyone is categorized as male, on the potential outcome if we counterfactually intervene so that everyone is categorized as female. Next, to show that the observed biological differences between sex category are at least partially explained by social gender mechanisms, using the first strategy, we can try to estimate what would the biological differences between men and women have been if everyone had been gender in the same way, that is, at the same gender score. So we also contrast 
uh, all, an all male population with an all male population, all female population, but, but where the gender score is counterfactually set at 0 0.5. So this is the control direct effect of sex category. We can also estimate the eliminated proportion, which approximates the share of sex differences explained by, by the gender score and is defined as the total effect minus the control direct effect relative to the total effect. For the second strategy, the reasoning is similar. We can try to estimate what um, the biological differences between one, when men and women would have been if everyone had the same social behavioral characteristics. So we contrast uh, now an all male population with, with an all male population, all female population, where all social behavioral characteristics are counterfactually set at a reference value. And for the the third strategy, we use somewhat similar approach where we estimate the total effects if the entire population had been in the so social group that we consider the less, least gendered. Um, however, this parameter won't provide much information about variability, uh, so it needs to be compared with the other total effects in different social groups or by using the eliminated proportion portion calculating similarly to the others, meaning the portion of the total effect of the sex category that would not been that would not have existed if the entire population had belonged to this reference social group. So now I will uh, briefly present a result of uh, an application of this strategy. So for this application, we used two Western populations from which we had uh, both uh, social and biological data. So firstly, we used um, the British birth cohort NCDS uh, 58, where biological variables were collected at age 40, 44, 45, with over uh, 17,000 living participants at that time. And secondly, we use uh, the first wave of the French court, Constance, focusing on the 40, 50 years old individuals, uh, with over, uh, um, representing over 20,000 participants. So regarding the measures, um, our primary, primary exposures were the sex category assigned at birth, uh, with administrative sex serving as a proxy in the Constance court. And we analyzed several biomarkers as outcome representing system evolve, involved in allostatic load, uh, including neuroendocrine, metabolic, cardiovascular, and inflammatory biomarkers, um, as well as anthropometric measures on other biomarkers that sometimes sometimes integrate into physiological scores uh, related to allostatic load. And we also used allostatic load uh, calculated according to several methods. And we use the same set of uh, intermediate variable, variables for both strategy based on mediation analysis, either to calculate a gender score using the gender diagnostic methods, methodology or separately. And the choice of variables was partly uh, based on their av availability in the data set and partly on your aim to, to characterize various dimensions of social life, as I said before, uh, by including variables uh, related to cultural, uh, social, and economic capitals, uh, and behavioral variables like smoking, diet, physical activity, and so on. Uh, other variables could have been included or uh, considered in different forms, and the times and numbers of variables likely impact the, the direction and magnitude of the estimated effects. Therefore, uh, it's, it's challenging in our view to interpret these effects in an absolute and generalized way. So the, this is what we aim to explore by using multiple sets of variables in sensitivity analysis uh, to examine of sensitive uh, the estimates where to the choice of variables used. And the four types 
type of measures used were the other exposures uh, that could act as confounders in the mediator outcome relationship. Uh, this included uh, social economic uh, social economic deprivation variable in the NCDS 58 cohort and parental occupation status, geographic origin, and age in the consent cohort. And socioeconomic deprivation and paternal occupation st status were also used um, in the as interaction variable in the analysis strategy based on the interaction between sex category and social environment. So uh, regarding my analysis method, so I'm using a causal uh, analysis framework based on counterfactual reasoning and G methods for estimation. Uh, I'm go just going to present the different step very uh, intuitively, I hope. So the process involves several steps. First, I create 1,000 data sets of equivalent size through random sampling with replacement from the ori original data set. Um, these bootstrapped uh, data sets will primarily be used to calculate confidence intervals. And in each data set, I perform a, a simple uh, multivariable stochastic imputation to handle missing data. And then within each data set, I, I model the outcome based on the exposures of interest, confounders defined a priori, and the mediator if it's a mediation analysis. And from each data set, I simulate population when I perform counterfactual intervention of the exposures um, on only the main exposures with our result, the mediators. For example, I might set the sex category as male or female in all the population. So using this simulated data set, I predict for each uh, individual the counterfactual outcome or, pot or potential outcome, meaning, meaning the outcome that would be observed in a scenario when the counterfactual intervention was performed. And the effect of interest are defined on the additive scale as contrasts between two or more mean value of these counterfactual outcomes, depending on the estimate I defined earlier. So regarding the results, in this population, we observed that uh, with the exception of salivary cortisol, there were significant biological differences between individuals categorized as men and those categorized as women for all the biomarkers considered. So overall, the anthropometric measures, uh, metabolic, cardiovascular, renal, hepatic, and respiratory biomarkers, as well as allostatic load, um, were generally higher in men, while inflammatory biomarkers was, were higher in women within this population at this age group. There were also significant differences according to early social environments, with biomarker levels being generally less favorable when the early social environment was deprived, so highlighting, uh, if it needs to be reiterated, uh, the impact of social behavior, uh, factors on biological outcomes, although the effect size were generally smaller than the effect of sex category. So regarding the main objective of the study, we indeed identified social gender mechanisms that explain the differences between men and women. So these mechanisms fell into three categories, mediation, attenuation, and interaction, or differentiation. So first, mediation. Uh, sorry, it's in French, still in French, but it's the same word. Um, so mediation, meaning that the effect of sex is partly mediated by social behavioral characteristic or by the gender score defined from these characteristics. So uh, here uh, on this graph, for example, um, we can see the portion of sex, uh, of sex ex explained by the gender score or the social behavioral characteristic taken separately. Um, so if individuals had been gendered in the same way 
or had the same behavioral characteristic, the gap between men and women would have been smaller for these biomarkers. So for example, in the constant cohort, uh, if men and women, again, had the same social behavioral characteristics, the average difference in blood glucose level would have been reduced by about 7%. Next, uh, attenuation, meaning that if individuals had been gendered in the same way or had the same social behavioral characteristic, the gap between men and women would have been larger for some biomarkers. And for example, in the Constance cohort, if men and women uh, um, had the same identified social behavioral characteristics, the average difference in neutrophil would have been 34% uh, larger, meaning even higher in women compared to men. And then um, effect modification. Um, so the gap between men and women is sometimes larger, sometimes smaller for some biomarkers when the early social environment was deprived. Um, actually, this, this variation uh, was explained mainly explained by the fact that the increase in these biomarkers levels due, due to early social deprivation uh, was, was generally stronger in women than in men. So that changed the male-female differences between groups. For example, uh, so it's the effect of early deprivation in each group. And uh, we can see, for example, for CRP, which is an uh, inflammatory biomarker, uh, early so social deprivation in increased CRP by 0.11 standard deviations uh, in men and by uh, 0.23 standard deviation in women. So in my view, the main contribution of this work to the contribution of gender in um, of studying gender in epidemiology lies in shifting the focus from merely defining a gender a gender variable variable to proposing um, a more dynamic and uh, and structural approach centered on strategy. So we have indeed demonstrated that it's possible to. Uh, analyze the impact of gender without using a gender variable by conceptualizing it as a structural phenomenon and operationalizing it at an effect of a difference or a difference in effect. Uh, actually, both um, strategies based on mediation analysis uh, led to similar results, making it seems more relevant to favor an approach that doesn't rely on a gender variable uh, for two, three main reasons. First, producing a score, in, in our view, is more prone to overinterpretation because it may obscure the loss of information, oversimplification, and non-exhaustiveness uh, uh, involved in using a single variable to capture a phenomenon as diffuse, complex, multi-level, and intersectional as gender. And it could lead to a form of essentialization of, or immobilization of what gender is, um, considering gender as an effect of sex on the distribution of social behavioral characteristics, rather that a direct component of these characteristics or individuals seems uh, therefore less risky. Secondly, the score complicates the interpretation. Using the variables separately makes hypoth hypothesis and interpretation, uh, causal hyp hypothesis and interpretation clearer and allows for better direction of subsequent analysis uh, or even intervention, for example, by targeting a specific pathway in terms of exposures and behaviors. And finally, the level of gender score in, is not solely due to the gender phenomenon, but also to other factors like social class, age generation, and so on. So the effect of such a variable is therefore difficult to interpret as a strict effect of a strict gender effect, which wouldn't include a part of class, age, and cultural effects, etc. So here again, using distinct variables helps um, avoid overinterpreting this result. 
in any case, even without using a score, fully capturing the phenomenon doesn't seem like an achievable goal. Uh, in the application, we observed that the size of the effects mediated by the gender score, but also by social behavioral characteristics varied depending on the set, set of variables included. So we cannot expect to capture all the social phenomena impacted by gender. So in my opinion, we will never be able to entirely distinguish sexual dimorphism from gender that explain um, biological differences between men and women because we will never uh, be able to capture all the social mechanism related to gender. Uh, lastly, the third strategy offers an original alternative for exploring this phenomenon, even though uh, interaction analysis raises technical issues, uh, such as the choice of the reference group of the scales, additive or multiplicative, the presentation of the results, uh, differential consistency, and so on. So additionally, interpreting the result was very challenging as we found it necessary to describe numerous parameters to understand the phenomenon, which was very difficult to grasp, especially when the effects did not go in the same direction. And moreover, in our study, um, and for the measures of social environment used, the population was really homogeneous, so it reduced the, the relevance of this approach. However, this third strategy based on interaction measures, measures is full of potential because it leads toward a more intersectional approach where we could explore the impact of gender system in relation to other social uh, categories such, such as class, class, race, age, and so on. So this opens up to many possibilities for investigating the complexity of the social mechanism involved in shaping health in social epidemiology. It also presents technical opportunities, for example, uh, for instance, through the use of multi-level models to overcome some of the limitation of interaction models. So in any case, uh, it, this represents a key per perspective uh, for this work. And uh, the results um, of this work also leads us to other questions like, uh, through which specific pathway do these effects operate? How do these effects vary uh, according to the social environment for life? Uh, do mediated effects and interaction effects capture the same phenomenon, etc.? And all these questions involve other methodological challenges uh, as we began to explore uh, at the end of the PhD, uh, such as measuring interaction effects when one of the variables is a mediator of the others on where there is intermediate confounding and so on. So this also opens up new perspectives and that would be uh, interesting to explore further. And I thank you for your attention.